Welcome to another episode of Talking Ball with Pat Leonard. I am the New York Daily News NFL columnist and Giants beat writer, and I'm thrilled to have Adam Schefter on the podcast today, ESPN senior NFL insider and the preeminent source for news and information in the National Football League. We talk about the Giants plans with the number six overall pick, the entire NFL draft, what teams to watch to make splashes. Is there another potential blockbuster veteran trade on the horizon like the Stefan Diggs to Buffalo Bills deal that Adam broke the news first on last week. We're going to cover all of that and more. First, want to tell you about Bet Online. The tournament is here. Bet Online is your bracket headquarters for this season with the best bracket contest out there, odds, lines, and info on every game and every round right up until the national championship. You can access the most up to the minute wagering information anytime from your desktop or mobile devices and even track your bracket real time all the way through the tournament. Head to the Bet Online website today and get in on all the action. Remember to use the promo code BELIEVE for your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet Online, the game starts here. And now, our interview with Adam Schefter. Adam, thanks so much for being here. Pat, thank you for having me. Always nice to be with you. You got it. Yeah, a Notre Dame man and a Michigan man collaborating and being civil. I think we can do it. What do you think? I know we can. I, we have done it before. We'll do it again. <laughs> all I know is. Uh, I sat in the stands at the big house in 2003, I think, and watched the Michigan offensive line get clapped off the field at the start of the fourth quarter in a 38, nothing Notre Dame loss. And so that always sticks in my side. <laughs> well, I remember rocket Ismail my first year after I graduated returning a kickoff or a punt against Michigan and ruining opening day for Michigan back in would have been 1990. So we each have memories of, the other school ruining a particular afternoon or day. Um, but I'm comfortable with where my school has been lately. Yes, I was I was go just going to say congratulations. Um, so, Adam, we want to talk NFL draft. We want to talk to you about everything. You're on top of everything in the NFL, the preeminent source for NFL news. But I also wanted to ask you about information and the importance of raising awareness about early screening for type 1 diabetes. I know a cause and an initiative that's close to your heart. Yeah, well, listen, Pat, I appreciate you asking, and I appreciate you asking off the bat. Basically, I'm pleased to be a Santa Spee spokesperson for the One Pledge movement, and it's the OnePledge.com. And essentially, type 1 diabetes cannot be prevented, but it can be detected. So what we're trying to do is, look, we're in the information business, right? We like information. So we're trying to give people information to get more information, to meet with their doctors, to be screened for type 1 diabetes. My wife is a type one diabetic. I watch what she goes with, goes through every single day. And to me, it's important for people to go be screened, to be a part of the one pledge movement, to go to the one pledge movement.com or the one pledge.com to see that they can get more information uh, to learn about what they can do to prevent this, what they can do to learn from this. And it's critical that people do this at this point in time. Again, we talk about information, it's there for people to go be screened in advance. And when someone has type one diabetes, it's something they can never stop thinking about. It's something you live with all the time. And that's why it's important for people to go to their doctors, to get more information, to go to the One Pledge movement at the onepledge.com to get more information about it. Thanks so much for that. And for the listeners and viewers, we will be providing this information again on the YouTube channel, in the comments, in the in the information and description of this, as well as on the podcast, as well as in the New York Daily News. So you're hearing it now, but I'll also have links to the website and you can go check out the One Pledge movement. Okay, so thank you for that, Adam. Thank um, you, Pat. As I mentioned, you're a Michigan man. And before we get into draft talk, I wanted to know what kind of excitement is there in Ann Arbor about having Wink Martindale, the former Giants defensive coordinator, running now the Wolverines defense with that scheme? Well, first of all, they haven't lost the game, so there's a lot of excitement right right now. But I would say this to you. They truly are really happy to have Wink there. And I know Wink is really fired up to be there. There's a lot of defensive talent there in Michigan, the interior part of the defensive line. They got a great cornerback in Will Johnson this year. And so Wink's got some real defensive talent on a team – that's going to have a lot of turnover on the offensive side of the football. You lose Blake Corum, you lose J.J. McCarthy, you lose Roman Wilson, you lose offensive linemen. And so this defense is going to have to come through. So it's going to be on wink to try to save the day early on until the offense can find its footing and get some experience. And I think he's 
really excited about the challenge of being in Ann Arbor, uh, of working with a great head coach like Jerome Moore and moving forward here in a new environment and a new setting. I, I think he's happy with all the new voices in his ears right now. <laughs> It's going to be fascinating uh, to watch Wink running the Wolverines defense, obviously, like you said, coming off the national title. A lot of eyeballs, but an opportunity as well. And sticking with Michigan, you mentioned J.J. McCarthy. Adam, you know as well as I do, he has skyrocketed up the board, so to speak. Just wondering your insight on what teams have told you and what you know about why has J.J. McCarthy gained so much steam? And in the end, do you believe he will be a top six pick? as a lot of people are speculating he could be. Well, let me say this to you, Pat. I was a little bit ahead of this curve in the sense that I remember I have a text chain going with my college buddies. Okay. And I remember them saying, you know, is Jim Harbaugh going to leave? I'm like, he's going to the NFL. Let, let's stop kidding ourselves. This is what he wants to do. And and they're like, well, maybe we'll have JJ back. I'm like, he ain't coming back either. Like They're <laughs> like, why wouldn't he come back? And I remember one of my college buddies, there's a chain of about 12 of us, him saying, He's going to be a mid-round pick. I'm like, mid-round pick? He's going to be a first-round pick. No, he's not. Yes, he is. We went back and forth. Long story short, we wound up betting dinner for the entire text group chain that J.J. McCarthy would be a first-round pick. I said he would be. My friend said he wouldn't be. So I was ready to book the dinner that night because <laughs> I was that confident that J.J. always was going to be a one. Now, I will say this. It's probably opened my eyes a little bit that – we're talking about him in the elevated circles that we are. Not that he's not worthy, but I, I was not thinking top six hmm. like you're talking about. And ultimately, I don't know where he's going to settle in. If we go back and look, there have been a long line of quarterbacks that we have heard link connected to high picks that didn't necessarily go in those particular spots. Right Last year, Will Levis was an example. Um, Aaron Rodgers at one point in time. Uh, Deshaun Watson might have went a little later. Geno Smith, uh, people in New York will remember well, as a guy right. who didn't go as high. So there usually are quarterbacks that don't go quite as high. Now, saying that, I think J.J.'s a one. I think he goes in the top 12 picks. I believe all that mm. right now. Do I think he's going in the top six? He could. I don't have the answer to it. Um, certainly... There has been a lot of momentum for what he's done, who he is. And I think part of this is that people have gotten to know the person that J.J. McCarthy is, and they see what he's about and the leader he can be. And the mm -hmm. guy has got all those intangibles. And then they do the deep dive into the film work, and they see, okay, very mobile, accurate, throws with touch, you know, can be a guy that a team can build around. So – to me, uh, the the ceiling is probably two or three. Uh, the floor is probably 11 or 12. I think the probably it'll come in somewhere in between, split the difference, right? In the end, ultimately, uh, my guess is he goes around 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. But you know what? Here's the thing. If and when we get three quarterbacks at one, two, three, if New England doesn't take them at three, mm -hmm. uh, maybe, maybe that's where Arizona and – the Chargers step into a great spot. The problem is if you're the Cardinals or the Chargers, are you willing to give up the best wide receiver or offensive lineman in this draft to go back uh, to get an extra one plus? Right. Are, are you going to do that? It's like, it takes two people. Like you need a team that's going to be willing to give up all that it's going to give up to go up. And you need a team that's willing to pass on Marvin Harrison Jr. or Malik Neighbors or Joe Alter, whoever it may be, and to get both of those to fit together, it's a, it's a lot. Not that it yeah. can't happen because there always are a lot of trades. I, I just think it sounds ambitious. And, you know, I think when J.J., if J.J. were to fall into that area where it's 8, 9, 10, the jet spot, and he's still there, maybe you'd be more apt to see a trade there because it wouldn't be as dramatic Mm. as it's giving up on a top wide receiver or the top offensive lineman. And it wouldn't take as much for a team like Minnesota or Denver or Las Vegas to trade up to get them. I, I just think it becomes more likely once we get past four and five for as much chatter as there has been about right. a six 
four and five being moved. Does that make sense? It does. It's a great point because these teams trading back, they have their clusters of the highest graded players, right? And they don't want to trade out of that. So I think you make a great point that if they don't have a player graded as highly at 11 as they, you know, at available that would be there at three or four, they're not just trying to go back. Yes, they may get a haul, but if they're not getting the premium players that they have at the top of their draft board, easier said than done to talk about it rather than do it. Right. I think that's correct. Cool. And, and, and I think that, you know, Marvin Harrison Jr. and Malik neighbors, these guys are transcendent talents in the eyes of scouts. So are mm. these teams willing to give up on those? Guys? They might be in the end. That's what makes the draft so compelling and so interesting. You find out what teams <laughs> really think and the moment of truth is upon us and we get to see exactly what happens then. I just think that, for all the talk there's been about teams trading up to four mm. and five, it's a little bit easier to talk about it than it is to actually do it. And we'll see how it unfolds. Well, so it might not happen, but in your view and based on your reporting, what is the latest on which teams are being most aggressive in trying to make that trade? You know, teams that have been mentioned, the Giants, the Vikings, you mentioned the Broncos and the Raiders. Are yeah. any of these teams standing out right now to you as being most aggressive in that push? I, everybody's watching Minnesota. I think that's the team because Minnesota essentially has picks 11 and 23. And what I think people really haven't taken into consideration here is that when Minnesota acquired the extra first round draft pick this year from Houston, that was Houston going to Minnesota and initiating that trade conversation, not Minnesota initiating it. And I believe and it was the first sign that told me that Houston wasn't done making big moves when I was told that Houston initiated that trade and that they were the party that wanted to initially get it done. That told me that Houston had something in mind. And lo and behold, Houston used some of that second round draft capital to go get Stephon Diggs. Mm. So that's what the Texans were thinking. The Vikings are just thinking, OK, we don't know where we're going. We don't know who we're getting. But sure, we'll take extra first round capital when we're trying to get a quarterback because everybody knows they are and we'll see where it goes. But it wasn't like they initiated that trade conversation. That was the Texans initiating it because I think they had Stephon Diggs on their radar and on their minds all along. That's a great example, too, of you having your sourcing, but also with your experience covering the league, understanding how those dominoes tend to fall. If this type of move happens, what am I looking for and asking about in my next phone call, right? Um, I think that's a fascinating look behind the scenes, too, because you break that news of that blockbuster Stefan Diggs trade, how one door opens and then possibly leads to another. Uh, that's really good insight. So how many quarterbacks do you ultimately think go in the first round? Because we obviously hear the Caleb Williams one. There's Jaden Daniels, Drake May, JJ, et cetera. Uh, a lot of hype, though, for guys like Bo Nix, Michael Penix Jr., yeah. and on and on. How many of them do you think end up actually going in the first? Pat, four locks, four locks, Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, Drake May, J.J. McCarthy. Put them down in the first round. They're going. <laughs> and then I think – And you're getting a free dinner out of it. <laughs> and I'm getting a free dinner. Well, Not only am I getting a free dinner, but all my college friends are getting a free dinner. And, uh, yes, one guy is going to be footing the bill for a nice, expensive, big, large party dinner. And we look forward to that. But – there's the two guys, Bo Nix and Michael Penix, where they could go as high as the middle of the first round, or they could be in the bottom of the first round or early the second day. So are we going to get one of them that creeps into round one? Are we going to get both of them? I, I think there's a chance we may get both because there are so many teams that are in the quarterback market. I think probably in the end, we'll probably get one and one probably makes it to day two. So if you're asking me today, I would guess five. I won't be surprised if it's six. Um, four's a lock, right? And then we can go from there. Four's a lock, five, possible, um, six, also possible. Yeah. Just depends, right? Again, I, I, I'm not quite sure how to answer it, mm -hmm. but it's part of the great intrigue that is the NFL draft. I'm fascinated by Penix Jr. and where he goes because watch him throw in person at the Senior Bowl, watch him throw in person at the Combine. We've all seen what he did at Washington. Uh, just a pure okay. thrower of the okay, football. So, what, so watching him at the Senior Bowl, watching him at the Combine, did you come away thinking he's a one, Pat? Talent-wise, yes. Is Or the yeah, injury so. flags push him down, but I think he's – you you agree? Yeah, I, 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 I 
If I had to bet, I, I, I give him a first round lean right now. Like, am I going to be shocked if he doesn't go in round one? No. But yeah. I think at some point in time, somebody's going to take a flyer on Michael Pan- Penix in round one, which would give us five. And that would leave us with Bo Nix, right? Mm-hmm. And I and I think Bo Nix is probably a one, two. So that, does that mean that there's six QBs in round one? It could be the case. We'll see. Fascinating. So outside of the Chicago Bears, they're obviously the headliner, Caleb Williams. They have the number nine overall pick. That trade they made really setting them up well. Outside of them, which team do you think everyone will be talking about when this draft ends? Like, Which team is going to make the biggest splash and open all of our eyes, and we're going to be saying, wow, they either really improved themselves or they went for it? Hmm. Well, Arizona still has two ones here. Right, Arizona sitting there at four in the first non-potential quarterback spot, and then another late-round pick where if there were a guy like Bo Nix or Michael Penix that slipped down there, uh, mm-hmm. Arizona could go take another guy at that point in time. I think 27 is the pick. A so Arizona, eight. well, yeah, a team could trade up to the, for a quarterback at that spot, right? So Arizona would be a team that I'm watching here. Um, wouldn't be surprised – uh, to see them trade one of their two picks, that would be something that would be worth watching here. Um, trying to think of another team here. You know, how about the Los Angeles Rams, who had their first first round pick since 2016? Just the fact that they're in the first round, you want to watch them because it's been eight years since they've made a pick in the first round. So that right. in and of itself is interesting. And I also, I guess, I'm watching Buffalo. You trade Stephon Diggs. What are you doing at wide receiver? I know a lot of people have suggested they can move up for a wide receiver. I think why not move back and have extra picks for extra wide receivers considering you need more players at that position. So, you know, here's the thing, Pat. When you ask me for a team to watch, yeah, the great part about the draft, we're watching all the teams. You know that. And yep. we don't know who's going to emerge as the headline on that Thursday or Friday night, but inevitably there'll be a ton of storylines and every team will have its own storylines. So, you know, there's not one team we're watching all of them. Yeah. There's always momentum for the draft. This year feels even bigger, you know, with, with, with all the quarterbacks, the teams that are up top and how many options there are for what teams could do trading out who they're going to select. It's fascinating. So obviously here in New York, the giants hold the number six overall pick. So there are all the eyeballs are on. What are the Giants going to do? Particularly, the conversation has settled on, are they going to go quarterback at six? Are they going to trade up for one? Or are they more likely to take a wide receiver? Adam, I put it to you. What are the Giants going to do here? Are they going to trade up for a QB? Are they going to take one at six? Take something up uh, else? Trade down? What do you see happening? Pat, there's a lot of things they could do, as you outlined very well there. To me, in the end, this is a team that has enough other needs in a team that is trying to win now that I don't, I wouldn't guess that they go quarterback at six right now. I do think that there'll be a quarterback selected with a pick. That's a relatively high pick, whether that's in round two or three, uh, or they move back up. If a guy like Bo Nix or Michael Penix is available, perhaps, Mm -hmm. but to me, to go quarterback at six, when there's going to be some incredible players on the board, when they have some of the needs that they do, I think I would be a little surprised. I never rule anything out at the draft, and they could decide to go quarterback. So I'm trying to give you all the options here. Yeah. But if I if I were making a friendly wager with you, I would say they're more likely to go wide receiver or offensive lineman than quarterback at six. But I do think quarterback is square on their radar. And I do think that they'll look to address that position at some point relatively high. Real quick follow-up to what you said. You characterized the Giants as trying to win now. I thought that was yeah. interesting. I thought that was interesting because this is technically a rebuild that Joe Shane's trying to take into the long term. But, and this is from my vantage point too, I agree with you. There is pressure to right. bounce back from last year. But I was just curious you characterize it very definitively that way. You view them as a team that's that's not waiting for the future here. You view them as a team that has to improve now to win? I, I don't view any team in the league as willing to just give up and give away a season, yeah. particularly in a market like New York. Because anytime you do that, you're opening yourself up to all the questions, scrutiny, and criticism 
that comes along with it. If they have another season that they had similar to last season, do you think the fans in New York are, are going to take that quietly and not be screaming for people's heads? There's no chance of that. So even though they're trying to rebuild and restock the roster to a certain extent, they're also trying to win now. They're not trying to give the season away. They're not saying, okay, we're getting ready for 2025 here. No, they're getting ready for 2024, despite the fact that there are holes, despite the fact that there are weaknesses. They're going to try to win now because if they don't win now, people are going to be angry and upset and furious. And inevitably in this league, when you don't win, someone usually pays the price at some point in time. No, fantastic insight there. Totally agree. Uh, you you had mentioned a couple of the potential game-changing wide receivers at the top of the draft or guys who yeah. look like they are. Malik Neighbors, Marvin Harrison Jr. in particular. Which of those guys do you think will be the first wide receiver off the board? Neighbors has kind of really charged uh, forward here in the pre-draft process. You know, I'll just say this. I go back to the combine. I remember sitting with one GM and the guy telling me at the combine, he goes, hey, I got to tell you right now. Malik Neighbors is my top rated wide receiver, and I'm not the only one. Now, that doesn't mean that Neighbors is going ahead of Marvin Harrison Jr. Will we be surprised if Arizona takes Marvin Harrison Jr. at number four? Not at all, right? right. Of course not. You know, you're talking about two elite wide receiver prospects. And by the way, Rome Adunze also is an elite wide receiver prospect. So there are really three elite wide receiver prospects, which is why it's hard for me to see the Giants – bypassing those players and the offensive linemen, the great offensive linemen that are in this draft and just saying, okay, we're going to go take the fourth rated quarterback over the number one or two receiver over the number one or two offensive tackle. Like, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's a lot to me. Um, And I think back to when they took Odell Beckham Jr. from LSU, you know, there were people that wondered about that selection. I can tell you that NFL teams, they view Malik Neighbors as this stick of dynamite, that explosive, that dynamic. And the comparison you hear is like Tyree Kill. Like, wow. Whoa. Yeah, I mean, again, is he going to be that? We'll see. Who knows, right? Uh, every college player coming out right now is being compared to somebody. Most yeah, of them yeah. not live up to that comparison. But I've heard Tyree Kill mentioned in Malik. Well, if you could get that kind of player, wouldn't you want that? Um, and again, I can tell you there are teams that do have him rated as the top rated wide receiver in this draft. Doesn't mean he will be the number one wide receiver taken in this draft, but there are teams that have neighbors as the number one. And by the way, I've heard people talk about Rome Adunze because we haven't talked about him as much as potentially the number one guy in this draft to a wide receiver. Now, I that's hard for me to imagine that he's ahead of Harrison Jr. and neighbors, but yeah. it just shows you the elite company that he's now being viewed as being kept in. A stick of dynamite. The Giants could certainly use that on their offense. So, Adam, we talked about you broke the news of the blockbuster trade, Stefan Diggs from the Bills to the Texans. There is often a, a veteran player trade or two that drop, that rocks draft season, often one that you are breaking. So Diggs obviously was huge, and this is pretty close to the draft, but is there a player or a team to keep an eye on for another one of those types of deals, like Brandon Ayuk from the Niners, for example, um, anything you're keeping a close eye on in that regard? Well, Ayuk is an interesting name. T. Higgins is an interesting name, right? You, if you want a wide receiver and you don't get the guy you want, are you going to be willing to trade your late one, your early two uh, for a guy like that and sign him to the type of long-term contract that it would take to get him under contract? I, I think those are two names, but you know, the truth of the matter, Pat, is we've seen so many trades already. Like I would have said to you, Hassan Reddick, but he got traded too last week, right? Like th there are a bunch of guys that are and have been traded already. Um, will we get more around the draft? Probably. Like I remember DeAndre Swift being traded to Philadelphia last year, day two. There's only, oh, that might've been day three, actually. Um, mm. It was day three. And so, there's always a, a, a couple of these trades that come out of nowhere. Um, and I'm sure there will be, again, uh, those wide receiver names or names to monitor and watch. I'm trying to think off the top of my head of another guy. You know, you look at guys who are headed into 
uh, contract years or have unresolved contract situations, the franchise tag guys. You know, I don't think Jacksonville ever would want to trade Josh Allen, but I can tell you there are teams out there I've heard that would love to go try to trade for him. Um, you know, do I think that Jacksonville do it? No. Do I think teams might call them? Yes. Uh, and that would be the case for any of these franchise players, I think. No, it's going to be fascinating to watch. Uh, we'll be watching your feed for when that drops, obviously, if one of those trades occurs. Uh, a couple more. Adam, we'll get you out of here. We know your time is very valuable. Yeah. Um, do you believe, going back to the Giants, do you believe that allowing Saquon Barkley to go to the Eagles puts any extra pressure on Joe Shane and Brian Dable? Just in the sense that, obviously, John Mara supported the direction that they went with that decision. But you know, if they're playing the Eagles and Saquon Barkley is defeating them and it's not just their rival, do you think that creates any kind of um, additional pressure on the GM and coach because they were the ones who decided to go that route and it could backfire in a bigger way? It's a good question. I would say not overtly, but certainly subtly. When you're in a division against the Philadelphia Eagles and they have the potential to have the type of season that they will, inevitably, if Saquon is Saquon, and the Eagles are the Eagles, and the Eagles have a 12-5 and five record this year, and Saquon runs for 1,400 yards, is that going to reflect positively on the Giants? No, <laughs> it's not. It's not. So uh, you don't not re-sign Saquon because you're worried he's going to go somewhere else, but it, you know that can't be a great look if he goes on and flourishes for a division rival. I mean, just, just think of any – team losing any marquee player to a division rival in free agency. If that guy shines for that team, that's not a great look for that. It just isn't. Now, again, it's not direct pressure, but if the season's going on and the Eagles had the kind of season that they did two years ago when they went to the Super Bowl and Saquon's the focal point of all that and he's in the MVP conversation, that that's a tough one. Indeed, which leads me into my next question. Are there three NF NFC East head coaches on the hot seat? Like Nick, Nick Sirianni, Mike McCarthy, Brian Dable, different situations, but whether it's their contract situation or the season they're coming off, I just want to know from the preeminent NFL newsbreaker from ESPN, are there three coaches out of four organizations in one of the most fascinating divisions in football with their jobs on the line going into this year? Well, well, here's what I would say. I think coaches in the NFL, their jobs are almost always on the line with the exception of rookie head coaches and guys who have won Super Bowls. Short of that, if you don't win in this league, your job security is going to be questioned. Hmm. We've heard a lot of talk about Mike McCarthy. We've heard a lot of talk about Nick Sirianni and if the Giants don't win, you'll hear talk about Brian Dable. It's just kind of the way that it goes. And inevitably, all three of those coaches are not going to be making the playoffs next year. In all probability, two, or at least one, maybe two, aren't going to be. And if and when at least one and maybe two don't make it next year, what's going to be the conversation in those particular cities, Pat? You tell me. You've done this a long time. You know the fan bases aren't going to be happy. They're going to be pissed off at the team, pissed off at the coaches, pissed off at the front office. It's just the way the league operates. Every coach, short of being a rookie head coach, and even some of them sometimes are in trouble, short of a rookie head coach or a Super Bowl winning coach is going to have questions every single year that he has to answer. And in the NFC East, there seem like there are more questions to answer, but that's just par for the course because some of these guys have been around for a while on accomplished rosters with great pedigrees. Right. It won't be quiet in these cities no, if those teams is. miss the playoffs. That's is. for sure. Adam, we thank you so much for your time. Um, again, the importance of early screening for type 1 diabetes. It was the One Pledge movement. Is that correct? The One Pledge movement at the onepledge.com. It's important for people to go talk to their doctors. Again, I am a Sanofi spokesperson. I want to emphasize Besides that, but the One Pledge movement at the onepledge.com is where people can get all the information that they need to be screened for type 1 diabetes in advance. And the disease can't be prevented uh, and it can't be cured, but it can be detected. And that's the most important thing people getting ahead of the game. We all want to be ahead of the game, Pat. That's the chance people have by going to the onepledge.com. 
Thank you so much for that information, Adam. Again, we will have that on the New York Daily News website, on our YouTube page, and on the Believe Podcast Network. This has been Adam Schefter, ESPN Senior NFL Insider on Talking Ball with Pat Leonard. Adam, thank you so much. Pat, thank you for having me today. Appreciate it. What an awesome interview that was with Adam. What an honor it is to have him on the Talking Ball with Pat Leonard podcast. Remember, we are sponsored by Bet Online, also by Estate 98 Coffee and Essencia de Cafe from El Salvador. Dates back to 1798. You can purchase it online on their website, through Instagram, or even on TikTok. Thanks for being here as always. Remember to check us out on the live chats, Talking Ball Live with Pat Leonard, Mondays and Thursdays, 9 p.m. Eastern. This current week here in April, we are recording Tuesday at 9 p.m. Eastern. Be there. See you soon.